Thank you guys so much for coming back for the big day, the heat treat day, which is, like I said in the last video, super exciting. If you haven't been watching the series so far, click the link up here. I believe I always get mixed up which side it comes in on. But uh, click that, go back, start at the beginning of the series. There's two more videos and see how the Bake Apple series is running. Very first run ever of a brand new design. Super excited. So today's heat treat, I have uh, a Devil Forge, uh, one of their smaller models. I've shown that before, but I'll show you guys in a few minutes. But what I've been finding is that that big direct torch in the middle is way too much heat for these pieces of steel. Now we're working with O1 steel. How heat treating works is uh, most O1, almost any O1 you'll find is sold in an annealed state, which is its softest, softest state. That's so that it's workable, you can cut it, you can grind it, you can file it, you can punch holes in it relatively easy. Once you harden it, it's not so easy. Now people get a few different terms mixed up in heat treating and that is tempering, hardening, quenching, these different types of terms, they use them interchangeably, but they're not interchangeable. Hardening is very different from tempering. Hardening is taking it from an annealed state into a rock hard state, and that is by heating it up to a high temperature, the temperature that that given steel calls for, and then cooling it very quickly. And what that quick cooling does is you freeze the, the you, uh, you freeze or seize the steel molecule structure in a certain state that's different than the annealed state. And that makes the blade extremely hard but also really brittle to the point that if you dropped it on the concrete floor or you tried to hammer on it, it would just shatter, or burst apart. There's so much tension in the steel. That's the hardening process and the quench, the specific word of quench means dipping it in or uh, dropping the temperature rapidly. O1 calls for an oil quench, some steels call for water, some steels call for a brine or a salt solution, some steels call for nitrogen uh, and, and different things like that. O1 I like because it's simple, it's, uh, it's relatively simple and we get to use oil so it's not too expensive to start off with. Now tempering is after we have that super amount of hardness and brittleness in, in the steel, which is great, we want the steel to be hard, but we can't have it so hard that it's brittle. So then we have to bake it in an oven and that's what's called tempering, which uh, that baking at X temperatures, we'll talk about later for X amount of time, that baking draws some of that brittleness out of the steel and brings a little bit of flex back in the steel. Um, you can vary your temperatures and your times in tempering to, depending on how soft you want that steel. Do you want it more on the softer side, say if you're, it's going to be a chopper, you don't want much brittleness, or do you want it uh, on the harder side, say if you're mostly doing fine cutting tasks and it's okay to have a brittle blade because you're careful with it. You have to choose what you want and cater these processes towards that. Now one of the issues I'm having with my forge is O1 likes to be heated up slowly. So with this thin O1, and let's see here, I have on average, what do I have? Roughly a mil of thickness left on the edge of each of these blades. It's pretty close there. Actually, those two are exactly the same. almost exactly the same. So roughly roughly a mil of thickness on each one of these blades and you need that left there because if you have too much thinness at the edge uh, there's just too little steel to hold heat and it'll either warp on you because it's so thin or it'll crumble which I have experienced both. So you want that thickness nice and even so it heats at the same amount of temperature and it's thick enough to hold heat. Now, with that thin of steel, O1 like this, 1 8 O1, ground down to a mil thick. Under the torch in my forge, I can realistically heat these up to temperature in easily less than two minutes, probably 90 seconds. You can have these up to, to orange, but that's not what you want for uh, O1 steel. So what I'm going to do here is cut this piece of steel pipe and I can stack all these blades in this steel pipe and put this inside the forge so I don't have the direct flame heat 
so I don't have that direct flame heat right on my blades. That'll, uh, I can just run the forge for a while with the flame on this, the knives inside, and bring that temperature up gradually. Now with our pipe cut to length, I'm going to stack these. We can eventually take these out once they get up close to temperature and finish the heating outside of here, but we just don't want them to take them from completely cold to, to say 1400 degrees Fahrenheit in, uh, in a matter of two minutes, two, three minutes. So by having them in here, and they're going to be, uh, it's a much heavier mass of steel to heat here now too they're all stacked together and then with this steel pipe outside and the flame beating on this it'll be a much slower bring up to temperature so this is my little forge this is a I believe a 10 inch by 6 inch capacity or something like that it's a beautiful little system I bought from Devil Forge uh, super great price and runs fantastically however I'm glad someone pointed out to me the inside of this furnace here is lined with what's called kao wool, which is a ceramic wool liner. And um, as that gets beaten with the compressed air, it, uh, it sort of breaks down. You get this fibrous material coming off of it, uh, becomes airborne, and that's really not good for you. I think it's somewhat similar to the idea of asbestos, so you really don't want to be breathing it in. So you want to be using it in a well-ventilated area. Uh, at minimum, but certainly I wouldn't use it without uh, a respirator. Now I have, um, you can buy rigidizer, you can buy different materials. I have a bucket of furnace cement that I'm going to layer this thing around with instead. I just haven't gotten around to that yet. So today, full respirator and, uh, and eye protection, which I'll probably always wear anyways. But if you buy one of these forges, just be mindful of that. quench temperature um, a magnet actually won't stick to the steel anymore it's a little more complicated this should be a little more precise than that but that gives you a ballpark area let it soak in that temperature for a little bit to really get it thorough and then you can do your quench and your quench has to be really quick after getting out of that flame because that temperature just sucks out of the steel so quickly now I don't use a specific quench oil I just use uh, an engine type oil just a 5 or a 10 W oil and uh, I'll heat that up a bit first. I'll heat up a piece of steel, drop it in there just uh, to give a little bit of temperature to that, uh, to that oil.
sorry I didn't get all the quenches for you guys. Once things get going like that, you just gotta move so fast to catch everything right where you want it. You don't want to overheat the steel for too long or too hard to, to overstress anything because then you're burning off carbon and, and different quality products within the steel. And you don't want to be as slow as to lose your temperature again and then you got to reheat again. Now these blades are still nice and warm. You don't want them to cool right down to room temperature. You want them to be warmer than that when you put them in when you put them in the in the tempering oven. So I'm just checking here now, just a file test to see. Seems like that's nice and hard. We don't have any scale with the, with this type of heat treat. So here we have it, six blades that have been quenched, so these have been hardened now. These should be up in the 60s Rockwell, probably mid 60s or a little higher Rockwell. So this isn't anything fancy here, this is just a toaster oven. And I'm going to maintain about 440 degrees for an hour. So between 400 and 450 degrees for an hour should give us mm, high 50s, 58 to 60 or so rock, rock well hardness, excuse me, which is, is still fairly hard. And, uh, and that's, for me, that's where I like a blade. I don't like a real soft blade. I'm not beating it around, throwing around, chopping, not doing a ton of batoning. So I like a little bit of a harder blade. That's where I'm going with these. So those blades have been baking for about an hour. In that little time I cleaned up the shop. Got a full uh, pickup load of garbage to take to the dump later today. Let's go see what we got here. I always throw on some eye protection anytime I'm doing something like this just because I don't know what could happen and I'm not going to chance nothing. Got that light bluish cast to them now, a yellowish cast to the steel that I uh... so here now we have a beautiful set of blades that have been hardened, tempered and they're looking great. What I'm going to do with each blade now is just a little test. So on, by the number on each of these blades there's going to be a little divot. What I'm going to do is do a little test with my punch here. Now if these blades are too hard, which they shouldn't be by this point, um, they could break. Of course, that's a risk if they didn't uh, temper enough. And if they didn't harden enough, which we did our file test, so they should be good, but if they didn't harden enough, um, I will put a nice big divot in each one, which lets me know that they aren't hard enough. So this is my super hard punch here. That's super hard. You can even hear the sound. Just barely left a mark, just in the dark finish. That was number one. Let's check number two. Exact same thing. There's number three. rock hard. These are super hard and they've obviously been tempered adequately. Uh, we've got no breakage, no shattering. You can hear they even sound a little different now I find. After heat treat like this they have like a, a higher pitch sound. We'll check them here. They all fit beautifully flattened together. You can hear that sound. Now we've got the annoying, arduous part of hand sanding each of these blades. I haven't found 
any other viable option yet of doing this other than hand sanding to get that nice perfect uh, striation there's no nice way of doing it keep everything wet that way you don't have to wear a respirator get yourself some good sandpaper and get to work watched a video by Alex Steele and he says something that I think is a lot of truth in and he says uh, buy the most expensive the best sandpaper and use it like it's the cheapest sandpaper and that is uh, tear a piece off as soon as it starts to to wear out, wear out a little bit or it's not as sharp throw it out start with a fresh piece okay now we've hand sanded all the flats on all those blades and now we're to the most intimidating part and the most skillful part of the entire process and that is finish grinding these bevels when I do these now that's the last time these will be touched uh, until the knife is possibly restored in 10-15 years time but uh, we've got to grind those try to keep on those flat planes not interrupt our stamps try not to change or raise the grind line at all and most importantly not overheat these bevels because it's so quick now because we're getting down pretty thin remember to uh, so we don't want to change this grind liner either into our stamp but also right at this edge it doesn't take much there to pull uh, a blue you'll you'll be running and you'll, all of a sudden you'll see this burst of blue come out by your edge and then you've you've overheated it you've made that uh, brittle or you've compromised the heat treat there so we don't want to do that six blades and you can see we've made some great progress this is a big part of our job done here now just to give you an idea okay this is number three check out that razor sharp grind line oh it's so addicting to produce that and you also notice that after heat treat because of that black from the the fire and everything the, our stamps are filled in with that now so they're, they stand out, they really pop, they're black you'll notice in some places like right down here we have still a little bit of black, a little mark there we didn't get out but I'll leave that and right here at the tip and that's because we have to throw a micro bevel on here anyway so that'll get taken up with the micro bevel we don't want to take off any more steel than we have to number two here Check out that grind line. Beautiful. Let's come over here. What do we have? Number four. What a beautiful grind line. If I do say so myself. Self praise is better than no praise. Love the shape of these blades. You can just see lovely three finger design there it's going to be just such a little razor blade in the hand and these are going to come sharp which brings me to my next point this is something i do now i actually finish sharpen all of my blades number six here i finish sharpen all of my blades before i do any handles so i'll put the micro bevel on here and then number one wow 
I will, uh, yeah, I'll put on the micro bevel with my small 1x30, and then I'll finish them on the stones right up to 6,000 and strap. That way, I know exactly how good my edge is. And by doing that, by putting on my, my finished edge before I do handles, I'll be able to do some, uh, some minor testing on the blades. So I'll run them all through some wood, I'll do a little bit of hacking out a piece of wood, I'll do some whittling and carving, and, and just see how that edge holds up. Anyone who's got a blade for me, your blade has, has gone through that treatment. I want to cross cut some material and just see how it's holding up. Is the edge rolling? Is it dulling real easily? And then I know we have a problem. I haven't yet. I haven't yet had an issue, but uh, but that's our next step. So that's it for this one. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. A lot of work done today. We did our heat treat, which seems to be quite successful. We did our finished sanding, and we did our finished grinding on all those bevels. So can't ask for much more than that in a day. It's a really good effort. Next episode, we're throwing those bevels on there. We're going to hand sharpen them all, and uh, maybe we'll get the handles done and glued up. We'll see. Thank you guys for watching. The support for this series so far has been great. I've had several inquiries about purchasing some of these knives. I have, I believe, two spoken for right now. Uh, number one is not available, but any of the others, uh, as of right now, they're available. And if you want to pick one up, send me an email, weederfan.business at gmail.com. I'll open it up to you guys who have stayed right to the end of the video and watched this. Thanks so much. Again, really appreciate the support. Please hit the like button, comment down below. If you're real, if you're really liking it, hit the share button, please. That's that's the biggest one. That allows me to get my videos instead of just in front of my friend circle. Once you share it, then that video gets uh, gets access to all your friend circle. So that's that's a big help right there. Thanks for watching, guys. I gotta go cool off. Have a great day.